Cool. Hello, one and all. I'd like to introduce you to the first AQR webinar of 2020. And it's a very special one because we've got Dr. Rachel Lawps talking with um, Matt Gladstone of Grey London. And it's on the occasion of the launch of Rachel's book, which is on the 3rd of March, it's going to be published. And the title is Using Semiotics in Marketing, How to Achieve Consumer Insight for Brand Growth and Profits. Uh, and we have a whole load of things which we hope you will end up doing at the end of this webinar. Uh, we promise that you will learn how semiotic, semiotics bridges the gap between consumers and culture. Uh, you'll instantly become more confident in talking about and selling semiotics and discover resources that will develop and boost your skill in semiotics. So here's hoping. Um, I don't think Rachel needs very much introduction, but she's regarded as one of the original founders of commercial semiotics. Um, and we hope it will be a huge success. I asked her beforehand whether that was something that even her closest friends didn't know about her. And she said that um, she's not sure about closest friends, but over to you. What, what is your pet or your lo love of your life apart from semiotics? Apart from semiotics. <laughs> Do you know what? If I'd been, if I, if I were a lot younger, like if I were twenty now, or fifteen maybe, I, I would probably become a professional video gamer. <laughs> yeah, I've been gaming for twenty five years. I've only been doing semiotics for about twenty two years. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a massive video gamer, and I do a bit of video games journalism on the side. Anybody who wants to read my excellent witty and charming reviews should let me know and also let some links. <laughs> <laughs> and today we also have Matt. Matt Gladstone is a strategy partner at advertising and marketing at Grays um, and he's a social anthropologist by training um, and he found his way into brands and advertising via selling whiskey in China for Diageo for four years and I asked him the same question and his wasn't quite as exciting and I'm not sure whether I believe him, but tell us anyway, Matt. What's yeah, sorry, I, I, can't, I can't beat the video gaming one, but um, I, I used to be able to speak Tibetan, uh, which is <laughs> a remnant of my anthropology time when I went and did field work in Tibetan refugee community in India. Um, You've let it lapse. I, I, yeah, there's, there's not much time to practice it or not much opportunity to practice it, I should say. Um, I can remember bits. But I do remember the first time I dreamt in Tibetan. I was so surprised I woke, I woke myself up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's kick off. Um, Rachel, was there a, a specific incident which actually made you decide to write this book or was it cumulative? I was inevitably going to write it, I think. It was, you know, I've been, I've been doing semiotics for 20 years now and I guess I could have written it 10 years ago, you know. I kind of I had enough knowledge of semiotic methods and enough commercial experience at that time that I could have written a good book. But I'm actually glad that I waited. I really waited until I was ready. And um, by that time, I had 20 years of supplying this stuff and making it useful for brand owners. And with the result that it wrote itself. And it, um, it was a real pleasure to write. And I hope, really hope that it's a pleasure to, to read. What it, what it does is is provides a kind of handbook, a guidebook to a self-contained kind of course in semiotics infused with 20 years of going out around the world and meeting consumers and experiencing different brands and experiencing different marketing strategies being applied. That's what it's about. It's about 20 years of my life. Apart from video gaming. That, um, there's even a little tiny bit of video gaming in there. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing else. <laughs> um, what apart from sales will make you feel that you've achieved what you wanted to with this book i want people to feel that they can see the way forward that we've managed to shed some light on semiotics finally okay because um semiotics started out from being completely unheard of 20 years ago and is now often quite widely but for various reasons it's still sh regularly shrouded in mystery and I personally think that's really unhelpful because there's, especially because there's a lot of people who are very much at the start of their journey with semiotics and they've kind of got the idea about 
identifying signs and symbols, you know, and saying, oh, red means energy and power and blue means science. Okay, so far, so good. But they kind of get a bit stuck at that stage. And the amount of mystery and uncertainty and confusion surrounding semiotics is not helping people to move forward. And what I want to do is blast away the fog and just shine a bright light on what's going on so that we can all um, really get, take advantage of what semiotics has to offer. And I mean that in the sense of making brands more profitable and also in the sense of taking on a personal challenge that is really stimulating and will encourage your own personal development. I've got one for Matt, which is really, I'm interested in, in what the trigger is, if, or if there is a trigger or if there is an element of commonality about it, when you think, okay, this is, this is an occasion to call Ghostbusters, or in this case, Rachel. What, what actually makes you ping an email or, or give, give her a call? It's, it's generally at the front end of the process. It's when you're first looking at a problem and you're trying to find a, a different angle in on it. So it's a bit like, I guess, if, if you're thinking about you're building a house, you start by going, well, where's it going to be and which way is it going to face? And how do I make it face that way, not that way? And that's what semiotics, at its, I think at its most powerful, does, is it just gives you a completely different orientation on something. I mean, when, when you look at the, the cases, the famous cases of, of the use of semiotics, right back to things like there was a very famous BT campaign many years ago, um, through to what we did with the UN and, and Vodafone more recently. It's, it's someone at the beginning of the process has gone, well, how can we look at this differently? How can we understand this differently? Uh, and just get ourselves 90 degrees in that direction rather than in the same old familiar. Otherwise, what you, you very easily start doing is you just start doing very tiny iterations on, on directions that people have done before in the world of marketing and advertising. And what you need to do is find, find your zags, you know. Does it always come up trumps or are there certain things, occasions where you think no, it's just not worked on this occasion? Um, it always gives you something. Whether it's like anything, whether, whether you always get a complete revolution or not is, is, is another thing that's kind of up to you and up to where you want to go and, and, and so on. But there's always something. And it's, it's also something that at the very least, funnily enough, creatives find very useful. The people who actually have to make things and draw things and decide what a logo looks like. Or, or, because it's very, very rich in executional symbolism, all of those good things which people who have to execute can use as well. So, you know, there will be a now, what, what does the shape of this font mean to people? Why is it that color? Why, you know, that, that is stuff that actually people that, that do the making find very useful as well. So it always gives you that. So where does it actually fit in the research process? And do you both see it as fitting in the same spot? Uh, just to just to more or less repeat, I would I always tell people, you know, just get on the phone to Rachel early. You know, when, when something comes in, if you're on a pitch or if you're working on a new product or, or if, you know, you're trying to just start the year plan again, you know, what are we going to do next year? It's just get on the phone now before you've gone too far down the road and you'll find she'll open up some new avenues for you, help you think differently about something. So, and Rachel, so, do you find you're, you know, you're called in at, at the beginning or at various points in the process? Thank you for that, um, Matt. That was kind words. Thank you. Um, so I work with a lot of different types of clients. And so um, uh, Gray is obviously an art agency and they really like calling me at an early stage and asking me to say something original about aspects of everyday life that we all thought were very familiar. And I really enjoy the challenge, of that, intellectual challenge of it, you know. Um, and Matt always seems happy with the results as well as you can tell. Um, and then other kinds of work that I do, I do work for um, brand owning companies. So all the big kind of global corporations, you know, whether it's household goods or finance or, or whatever energy or whatever it may be. And they will um, hire me to do blocks of primary research where often there's a significant overlap with ethnography sometimes. Um, and might involve physically traveling to different parts of the world to have encounters and experience things and then kind of think about that from a semiotic point of view. That could be a self-contained market research project that's on a similar sort of scale as um, doing a small ethnography project, you know. 
Um, and then also I will also from time to time work with specialist research agencies. So sometimes you've got research agencies that really specialize in a particular sector. They're looking for a way to differentiate themselves and stand out from the, the crowd. And what I can do is really add some kind of depth and spark or to proposals and qualitative data analysis. So in that situation, they might do some qualitative research and then call me in to be involved once we've got some data to look at together and I can say interesting things about it. So in other words, I will get involved in all aspects of the, the research process. And sometimes semiotics is the research in its own right. And in fact, that probably accounts for most of the work that I do. What can it do and what can't it do? And are you ever asked to do the impossible? Uh, what it can't what it it's not so much questions what it c can't do is what you probably shouldn't do with it <laughs> and, you know just because you can doesn't mean you should i think um what semiotics can do is going to change as you become more experienced with it okay when you're new to semiotics what it's going to do is tell you what plan communications mean that's the first thing it's going to deliver okay and that's useful for you and it's useful for your brand owning clients if you can tell them if you do your ice cream in this packaging it's going to sell more okay that's a lot of people stop there if you pursue semiotics in a serious way and i mean like really reading about it and thinking about it and doing it on a day-to-day -day basis not just when you've got some work on your desk what is semiotics will eventually do is is enable you to answer some questions about not just what brand communications mean but what everything means everything <laughs> the, the human condition love why is there a global epidemic of anxiety you know um uh it, it can tell you something about politics and social change um and to a certain extent it gives you a vision of the future and it just takes, if it takes, just requires you to really engage with this challenging question at the heart of semiotics, which is the Sluella. Okay, if anybody wants to join in with me here, because that's what I hope we're all going to do, yeah? Semiotics is not just a market research exercise. It, it's a, it's, it comes out of philosophy and it poses this deeply challenging question, which is this. What if everything that you currently think of as being reliable reality, everything like the physical world, um, your body, um, your relationships with other people, um, uh, laws of physics, everything you can think of that seems reliable and sure and certain. What if the whole shebang is made out of semiotic signs? What if every single last bit of it is socially constructed and it's made out of semiotic signs? And that is a very difficult and challenging question. It kind of hurts your brain sometimes to think about it. But if you really pursue that question, there's no aspect of your life to which it will not apply. And there's no, nothing you can encounter in your life which will not require a bit of work when you tackle it using this, this semiotic point of view. It's extremely challenging, but if you just do it persistently over a number of years, you eventually can say more than just what ads and packs mean. And you can eventually say something about what it means to be a live mayor. You can eventually say something about the human condition. That's why I'm doing it. That, and that I would I like to think that some of the region of these people are gonna come on that journey with me. Blimey, I, I didn't expect an answer like that. Um, on the one hand, it's sort of look, looking at, at it, it in that light would be enough to drive you mad. On the other hand, it entails a sort of 360 degree, all encompassing look at everything. You know, I can imagine a client going, I didn't realise that that's what it could do or it could operate under the rate. I thought it was a pack. Research. Clients learn about semiotics just like researchers do, okay? You've got clients who are at an early stage of learning about semiotics and clients who are much more advanced with that, okay? So a client who is new to semiotics, often very easy to work with, and what they want to do is send you some advertising and some packaging and they want you to pick out semiotic signs and tell them what those signs mean, okay? And that's great for everybody. Their yeah, ads and packaging improves, profits go up, everybody's happy, right? A, cl a client who's had more experience with semiotics, sometimes over a number of years, like senior people at Gray, for example, develops this much more sophisticated appreciation of what it can do, and they start to ask more abstract questions. You know, I'll call you up and say things like, what's the state of the modern family? Or In Ireland. what's women's <laughs> relationship with technology? Let me come that back to Matt. Yeah. I think, I mean... For us, 
if you were thinking about the role of semiotics in your armory of, of research, I think it's helpful to think about where different research techniques have come from in terms of understanding people and people's behavior. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, is get people to think and do things differently. And the, if you go way, way back in time, people thought about human beings as kind of very rational actors in a kind of, you know, crude economics world of rational self-interest. Um, and they asked people questions accordingly. So from about the 70s onwards, people got into psychology and understanding that actually people behave because of non-conscious motivations. And, you know, we've seen behavioral psychology, for example, come out of that. And we've seen behavioral economics and we've seen, you know, uh, thinking fast and slow and all of that stuff come. And I, I think semiotics does that because it understands absolutely from the outset what it's trying to do is get beneath the skin of, of people and how they behave but it then goes further into where people are pushing out now you know you'll hear people talking a lot about culture now because it's like the world is caught up with what i did cultural anthropology and <laughs> notice that, that people do not behave as individuals people behave because of the way they see people around them behaving you know i do things because my best friend does it because my husband wife partner kids whatever do it and i do things because of what i want them to think and I do things because of the way that I am trained to do things by the people around me. And then that is shaped by everything I see around me and, you know, cultural pressures and, you know, hence people talk about the cultural forces and discourses around me. And that's what semiotics is also looking at. So it's looking at the, the unspoken stuff, the, the un, you know, if you like, the, the underwater bit of the iceberg of people's behaviour. And it's doing that not just on the basis of individuals like psychologists would, but it's doing it on the basis of the crowd pressure and the, and, and the cultural pressure. And when you think of what we're trying to do, which is to basically build brands and build behavior around product services, we might talk about the United Nations later and what we did there, but people, the way people feel about the world around them and the people around them and what they're expected to do is incredibly important in all of that. And semiotics is one of the few disciplines that's really focusing on giving us answers there. And if you can tap into that with a brand or an organization or a cause, then you can actually be much, much more powerful. And, you know, a lot of brands have done it. They've done it sort of unconsciously. When you look at almost any, any great famous, for the want of a better word, brand, mm. they will have done this. Um, you can read, I think it's Douglas Holt on, on cultural branding as well, would be a good partner, read with this book. Uh, and some really vintage cases there uh, from the Marlboro Levi's and things like that. But every, everyone who builds a great brand plays in this space and understands what, what they're doing means to society and to people as a whole, not just as individuals. And that's what semiotics helps you get under the skin of. It would be good to get some idea of a, a brand or a, yes, a brand and how semiotics has helped it or come up with a, a question or a solution that maybe sort of astounded you both. Um, you were talking, I think, about the UN, but there are very, various other ones. Are there ones that make you you ask the question and the, the answer comes back and you go, hmm, mm, didn't expect that? It's like that every time for me. <laughs> every time it's like that, yeah. <laughs> because I work on such a wide variety of different things, you know. Every time Grey calls me up, it's something different. And also with my other clients, I work on different stuff all the time. And I'm sure a lot of market researchers know that feeling, right? So, you know, one week it's banking and the next week it's some rare, you know, genetic disorder. And the next week it's pets and the next week it's something else, you know. And so I guess one of the advantages of being in this line of work is that you're exposed to all these different types of experiences and you gain all this cross-category knowledge, you know. And then I guess what semiotics will add, what I find it really helps with is, you know, I think with a lot of qualitative research, there's not that much of a theoretical framework surrounding it, you know. So you've got kind of perfectly good researchers who are really sensitive interviewers or whatever. But when it comes to the analysis stage, there can be an element of sitting there going, well, what seems to be the main themes in these transcripts? And it's, and it's never really specified what a theme is, you know, and as, it's, it's kind of as a framework for thinking about what are we doing when, it, when we analyse quantitative data. There's a limit to how far you can go with it. It's like using a small paintbrush or something. But I think of semiotics has been like this big 
Black and Decker power tool that you can do all kinds of things with it, you know. And as a result, I know it's going to solve my problem. It doesn't matter what you ask me about. You can call me up tomorrow and ask me about the semiotics of some topic I've never considered before. And I know that this set of tools for thinking that I've got available to me is going to answer the question. I just don't know what the answer is yet because I haven't, I haven't done the work, you know. So there's always like a that feeling at the beginning, like I actually haven't got a clue what the answer is going to be. Ask me in two days or a week or something, you know. And then at some point during that time, it'll swim into view and it's a surprise every time. And so normally my clients case... are surprised as well. They're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's great. We wouldn't have thought of it that way, you know. Is there a case study that really hits you, at, at sticks in your mind, and, and you think, oh, yeah, I really appreciated that? Um, it was an interesting one. And that showed what semiotics can do. What do you want to talk about, Matt? All the stuff that's in my mind is like stuff I'm working on now, which I can't really discuss. <laughs> what have we got that we can talk about? We could talk about, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you some options. And then you can, I mean, we could talk about Vodafone in Ireland and technology. Okay. We mm -hmm. could talk about the United Nations. Uh, we could talk about McVitie's, mm -hmm. talk about Cathedral City. Okay. Happy to talk about any which you think is. Let's talk about the United Nations. That was quite a stimulating one. Yeah. It was something a bit different, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so we had, we were talking to the United Nations, and this is, by the way, the thing that ended up with, just to give, let the cat out of the bag, this is the thing that ended up with David Attenborough doing his speech at the United Nations and having, for the first time, a people's seat at the United Nations. And he gave a, his speech was actually crowdsourced from the people of the planet. Um, and he was there as a representative, not of any nation or political power grouping but just of the people, which is the first time any of this had happened. So that was the output which began with this. And I guess if I go, what the, the problem that they came to us with was they said, hmm, we think we have a bit of a perception problem with the United Nations. Mm. And in particular, we haven't got anyone engaging in our SDGs, our Sustainable Development Goals. All, and there's an awful lot of them. And we want people to engage with them. How do we get people to do that? And we went somewhat off the rails with them and ended up where we ended up. Um, but yeah, Rachel, do you want to talk? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. So the way that I, I, I tackled this question of what does uh, the UN mean and what can it mean? There were a, a couple of different pieces to that. So um, part of what I was doing was looking at, there was this target audience of millennials. Part of what I was doing was looking at um, what they find motivating um, politically and also in terms of like morals and ethics and stuff like that because they seem to have quite actually quite strong um, or certainly strongly expressed morals uh, but they um, can be uh, I guess a bit different to what previous generations might recognize and so I did a bit of early research on what kinds of moral issues get people motivated then uh, the, for me a part of this research that was really super fun was to look at where people get their ideas about the United Nations as a kind of um, entity. Because if you think about it, most people, especially young people, don't have any contact with the organisation at all. Right? And so they're, um, uh, you have to ask where would they encounter the idea of the United Nations? Like where would they even run across it? You know? And uh, um, hilariously, one way in which the United Nations is really evident and really visible in pop culture is in action movies. Yeah. So you'll find it, the United Nations regularly appears in sort of like Captain America, for example, these kind of superhero action movies. Or um, also there was uh, Sasha, Baron, Sasha Baron Cohen a few years ago did his film The Dictator, which is uh, also very funny and is a kind of spoof movie about um, where he plays this kind of Middle Eastern dictator and goes and introduces, presents himself to the United Nations. So the UN actually appears all the time in these big budget movies. And you can move, this is for some of where people get their ideas from, you know. Uh, when, when you say the UN, it's always pictured in the same way. It's always like a, quite a nice large room that they're sitting in. There's loads of people. No one's able to communicate with each other because they all come from different countries and they don't speak each other's languages. So there's like this wall of non-communication between everybody in, everybody is in the room then you've got somebody at the front who's usually an old man making a boring speech <laughs> and then something there'll be a massive explosion and somebody will come blasting in through the plate glass windows and that's really what the UN is for it exists to be blown up you know and so, 
<laughs> so that combined with when you, if you then actually go and visit like the UN's, I went out to look at the UN website at the time and all of their branding was really kind of cold and remote and gave this impression of being like just really emotionally and physically a long way removed from ordinary people. And you begin to see how people would form the idea that the UN is not really anything to do with us. They don't seem that interested. They get, a, you know, they kind of, the ideas that circulate in popular culture is that it's just, it's just some strange older people who don't, don't communicate very well all sitting in a room together until Captain America shows up and kicks the, <laughs> kicks the windows in, you know. <laughs> so once you know that and you combine that with some insight about what actually is morally and politically motivating for younger consumers right now then you've got a chance of being able to get the brand back on track we've got a question in from uh caroline who says it, it may not be the un but can it be an effective tool at diagnosing why a category or brand is struggling yes there could be a couple of reasons why that might be and um one could be that it's a well-established brand that has been successfully using semiotic signs for a long time and they've gradually fallen out of date so you let's say you've got a very old brand of whiskey or vodka or something like that you know and it's covered in um, signs and symbols with uh, like badges royal looking badges or military emblems and things like that and it was okay in the 1960s but now it's sort of in terms of relevance and meaning it's fallen by the wayside and it needs a uh, a kind of refresh. The other way brands sometimes have problems, for example, with newer brands, is they've kind of, they might realise that semiotic signs exist. They've tried to have a go at picking out some good ones and they've sort of randomly mixed all these semiotic signs up together in a way that doesn't really make sense. And so you've got arrows pointing in different directions. I don't know if Matt's got any thoughts on that. That's all. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think in a way that the best semiotics are sort of quite obvious in retrospect. And that you can you can look at a category or a brand, and you can go. I mean, the simplest way is like you've been saying: it's it's a category or brand that's kind of going out of date. Is is a layman's way of putting it. That quite mm. often happens. It's just culture and the way people want to be and the things people want to say to themselves and to each other change. I mean, you could look at food at the moment and the, the massive rise of veganism, mm. um, and and you can look at a brand. So, I mean, it's something we can all do now. We could look at that quite probably as, as kind of amateurs and go, well, if you're not riding with that, then you're going to end up being in trouble. Now, those things happen in much more subtle ways around brands as well. And that's you know where it's particularly useful to call someone in who's going to dig in and have a look. I mean, we did some stuff on fintech recently together, mm. looking at you know business to business fintech brands. Now, that's something where it's much harder for someone just to jump in and have an opinion and you'd be much more method methodological sorry careful about looking at it um and, and 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 dig through it so you can look for those things and you suddenly as you sort of almost archaeolo archaeologically sort of scrape away at the surface and you, you dig down you go oh hang on this is what's going on and this is where no one's gone and when we look at this category over there that's what people are spending the rest of their time looking at so why isn't this category moving with them um, so, yes, is the You're back to the 360 question. degree, I think. Um, I, from a purely personal point of view, I was interested in um, if now we're in an era of deep tech initiatives, is semiotics capable of delivering answers when entrepreneurs are tackling what appear to be insurmountable problems? And it's, it's rather like the known unknown or the unknown unknown. Can it deliver answers to something that you don't even know that there's a question there? Yeah, I think so. I think this is why people will call me up increasingly. As I said, there, you know, some clients are very experienced with semiotics. And those are the clients who have the confidence to call me up and you know, they haven't actually, there's not a detailed brief in writing. It will be, might be something along the lines of, can you say something creative and original about X, Y, Z factor of everyday life, ASAP? And so there's a, um, 
there's a, a trigger that gets pulled at that point. And uh, there are things that you can just techniques that you can use with semiotics to stimulate innovation and creativity, which are not very much known about. And this is something else that I kept in the book. But again, because people tend to know about semiotics ability to decode brand communications. A lot of people think that's where it stops, but it's actually it's full of techniques which you can use to break open your imagination and make yourself capable of thinking new thoughts and um, ha spot opportunities for business and have ideas for innovative new products and services. There's loads of stuff you can do in that area. So this is, again, this is something I wanted to kind of write about just to make people aware of it because it's some of the most, this is some of the most fun stuff you can do with semiotics and it's really useful for business. I mean, is it a different vocabulary? You were, you were saying, you know, people or researchers don't truly have a handle on it yet. It can be a bit difficult with the vocabulary, but it's, these are surmountable problems, you know. There, these really are surmountable problems. There is a certain amount of technical language, as you would expect with anything. There's technical language of neuroscience. There's a, a lot of technical language of statistics, okay? It's never going to be that technical. It's never, you, if, if, you can, if you're not afraid of statistics, you don't need to be afraid of semiotics. It's not that hard. But um, having said that, um, there are people out there who struggle with the... The language or other people who just like using jargon because they think it makes them sound clever N none of this is really helpful i think that um that with with this sort of situations where you've got a potentially difficult topic that is also useful the, the trick is to try and make it accessible and make it easy for people and that's you know kind of part of my mission here is to say look this is totally accessible anybody who wants to do good semiotics and to benefit from that by making brands more profitable obviously but also for their own personal development you can do this you really can and semiotics is accessible to you yes there's going to be one or two technical words but don't worry i've got your back <laughs> there's a glossary at the back of the book everything's clearly set out in stages just if you do the instructions if you do all the exercises in the book in order don't skip any do all of them by the end of that book you're I would say, say that you're competent in to, able to do semiotics. You've got a long journey ahead of you, but you'll be able to turn out a competent looking research project using semiotics. I think we're coming up to the end of it, but I, there's one question uh, which was lobbed in, which I uh, honor bound to, to ask, which is some people think of semiotics as a method and others talk about it like it's a range of numerous different techniques could you map out how you see the different forms of semiotics that are used in the commercial world? I don't know if it's that helpful at this point to do that because all it's going to do is lead to arguing about what's methodologically better. And I think let's just be, um, if we want to be empirical about is semiotics any good, let's ask our customers, you know, it just uh, there are clients out there who've had good and bad experiences with semiotics talk to the ones who especially talk to the ones who've had good experiences and get their recommendations if they're telling you yes we used semiotics we bought it from so and so it really helped our business then i think we can trust their business experience i think that's probably a better way to look at it rather than having the research community tie itself up in not so uh, <laughs> different types of semiotics and which is better. The better one is the one that gets business results. Fair enough. Um, and whenever I hear about semiotics, people always mention culture. Um, why? What's the big deal about cult culture and how is it useful for business? Shall I jump in? Yeah, please. Give you a break. It's kind of like, I, rather like I was saying before, because people, do not behave individually. It's, it's a sort of insight that is growing in, in acceptance, but we, we are not predominantly individual decision makers and individual actors. We do things because of the social setting in which we find ourselves. You know, we do things because our friends do it. We do things because we want to impress people. We do things because that's what we're brought up to do. Almost every, we are apparently statistically the most socially dependent species on the planet um so and that culture is really the word we give to all the stuff that binds us together 
everything that isn't psychology, if you like, that is the, the, the things that we all do together and the rules we create for ourselves and, and the way we behave. So anyone who is trying to, well, A, understand, but B, do something with behavior and influence behavior, who isn't accounting for and thinking about culture in that is, is missing out over half the picture. You know, it's, it's a bit like thinking, I don't know, I don't know what, what the equivalent would be, but you're, you're trying to go swimming without being, there being any water. I mean, it's, it's, you've got to think about culture when you think about influencing human behavior or, or you're, you're going to be very, very weak indeed. Rachel, do you have any, anything more to add or would you like to leave it there? I guess um, I wanted to say, guys, everybody listening, this is fun, all right? This is the most fun you can have at work, I guarantee. <laughs> Take up semiotics today. <laughs> you will not, not look back. You, will not you, always look, you always look forward to a good semiotic report. <laughs> There's nearly always something amusing and fun. Right? There's like something my... in there that makes you laugh. It changes your view of the world. Yeah. It's refreshing. You feel more awake at the end, right? Yeah. 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 Good cheese, recommendation. cheese is filthy and dirty and also wholesome and family. You know, I think <laughs> that would be one of yours. <laughs> well, uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave it open to the, the people who are listening. If you have any questions, lob them in. But if not, I'm going to say thank you very much to the pair of you. Uh, and it's been a delight. And I, I want to learn about semiotics now. The book's out 3rd of March, Luana, available now for pre-order on Amazon and Code and Page. <laughs> <laughs> right, before I go, I would like to uh, flag up three um, events that, or things in AQR's calendar. There's Sparks on the 25th of Feb, which is on mental health and well-being. There's Breakfast Bites in the North, which is in Leeds on the 27th. Um, uh, 28th of Feb is the deadline for the inaugural Parker Prize for Emerging Talent. So go and have a look at that on AQR's website. Um, and thank you once again, both of you. It's It's been good. Thank you. Thank you. And Rachel. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.